Okay, hi, this will be atherosclerosis part one. Um, we got a new way of drawing here for this uh, YouTube channel. So we'll start out with the Winkessel effect. The Winkessel effect is the ascending thoracic aorta. See, I got a model of the heart right here. When the heart pumps blood, that's called systole. And that's left ventricular contraction. Then the blood goes up here, oh, I don't know if you can see it, into the ascending aorta. So I've drawn it here on the picture as well, the ascending aorta. And when the left ventricle contracts in, the ascending thoracic aorta expands outward because of the pressure of the contraction. Let's say it's a stolid pressure of 110 over 70. It stands outward, and that's during cardiac contraction systole. During diastole, the heart now relaxes, and the ascending thoracic aorta recoils inward. That's called elastic recoil. And that maintains good blood flow during diastole, cardiac relaxation. Some of that blood flow goes retrograde down into the coronary arteries. The vast majority goes upward. The branches coming off the top of the aortic arch there are the, you know, the uh, brachiocephalic artery. It's going to bifurcate into the subclavian and the common carotid. And then the key point is that the ascending thoracic aorta is like a second heart and it maintains diastolic flow. You have a lot of elastic fibers in this area. And that is important to maintain that diastolic flow. A person cannot replace those after about 20 years of age. When they're done with puberty, they're also done making new elastic fibers in their ascending thoracic aorta. And normally, that's enough to last an entire life. In low salt populations like Yanomamo, for example, they've got the same blood pressure in their 70s or lower as they did when they were uh, children. Okay? Um, so that's the Winkessel effect. And the significance is, People don't get atherosclerosis until after they tend to have started to diminish their Winkessel effect. And most persons, let's say, growing up in this country, they've eaten a lot of meat and oils and processed food and junk food, and they've worn out a lot of those elastic fibers. Um, so that's partly why everybody looks good until they're about 35 years of age. And then if they've got bad habits, they start going downhill uh, more quickly. The more bad habits, the faster they start aging more rapidly. Uh, like cigarette smoking, for example, really accelerates aging. Okay, so Winkessel effect is progressively lost, and once it's lost, they can't maintain diastolic flow, so they have to increase systolic flow, uh, the cardiac contraction phase. So here's a diagram of blood pressure, and let me see if I can scoot it over a little bit. I've got to go into this other program for one sec here. Okay, I think I got it to work now. Okay, so what's happening is I got to go in and out of these programs. It's the only way I can get this thing to work. When you look at these pressure curves, the green is for normal blood pressure. Let's say about 110 over 70. The red is a very hypertensive person going up to a systolic pressure of 200 over 100. And the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure is the pulse pressure. So it's good to have a narrow pulse pressure. A really wide pulse pressure is another uh, common finding with these hypertensive patients. And so what I'm also saying is after people are over 50 years of age, they start having less and less diastolic hypertension. That's because they don't have that much elastic fibers remaining in their ascending thoracic aorta. Okay, but again, like we were saying, the more they lose elasticity and the ability to have elastic recall during diastole, the more systolic hypertension the person is going to have. Um, next thing I want to talk about is red blood cells. Typical red blood cell here is about 7 microns. And that's just a little bit bigger than a capillary. A typical capillary here is about 5 microns. And because of that, down here you can see the red blood cells deforming. The red blood cell has to deform in order to pass through the capillary. I got a little bit of a double mouse effect here going on. And I think the computer's like recognizing two programs running at the same time. and uh, the mouse, for some reason, is visible on both of them, but be that as it may, the RBC is deforming a little bit when it goes through the capillary. It has to deform to pass through the capillary because the RBC is 7 microns, capillary is 5 microns. That's going to end up being a big deal because things that stiffen the red blood cell are going to make it harder for that red blood cell to pass through the capillary. And because of that, blood pressure has to go up. So anything that stiffens an RBC, things like excessive dietary saturated fat, are going to make it harder to go through there. Okay. All right, the next thing we talk about here now is the spleen. The spleen is, you know, in your, uh, sorry, your left upper quadrant. That's like the graveyard for red blood cells. Typical red blood cell after 120 days, 
approximately is removed from the circulation by the red blood cell. They've got very tight things, smaller than capillaries, and a red blood cell that's more stiff. Older red blood cells are more stiff. That ends up being a big deal too. What's the main reason for that? They think it's glycation, but it's not exactly clear. It's also because their metabolic processes start running out. A red blood cell does not have mitochondria. It does not have a nucleus. So its metabolic processes by 120 days are starting to run out because you can't replace uh, the new proteins in terms of you don't have uh, DNA in there. You don't want to have mitochondria in the red cell, you know, stealing the oxygen away from the, the hemoglobins. So a red blood cell is basically a bag full of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, of course, is the oxygen-carrying protein. And the spleen removes them. That's also relevant because some people have had surgical removal of their spleen, let's say for you know, post-traumatic bleeding. And then once the spleen's removed, you get more of these red blood cells sticking around a prolonged amount of time, and they're heavily glycated, and they're very stiff, so pressure has to go up to pump them through the circulatory system. Um, you can also get a non-functional spleen in some diseases. And that also becomes relevant when you think about a woman and when she's postmenopausal. Um, normally, the red blood cells, when they first come out of the bone marrow, they're more flexible. And because they're more flexible, they deform more readily, and you can pump them through the circulatory system and the capillaries with less blood pressure. Um, in addition, when a woman menstruates every month, that's like a therapeutic phlebotomy. She's lowering her hematocrit. Red blood cells are by far the most common thing in the blood, in the peripheral smear, such that when they are more stiff, it has a big effect to increase blood viscosity, blood thickness. So the blood's more like a milkshake and less like water. Pressure has to go up. The thicker the blood, the higher the pressure. The more constricted the, the blood vessels, the higher the blood pressure. And so this is the reason why premenopausal women almost never get a myocardial infarction unless they're like 200 pounds overweight or something unusual. They've got bad lupus with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or something like that. It's really rare. I can't even think of a time. Um, I know a woman who had a premenopausal myocardial infarction. Lower hematocrit and less stiff RBCs because they're more flexible when they first come out of the bone marrow. Okay, so that's the scoop on that. Let me move these slides along. Okay, now we're going to look here at a peripheral smear. As I was saying, the vast majority of cells on a peripheral blood smear, you just put, uh, you draw some blood, you put it on a slide, are going to be red blood cells. Very, very few WBCs, white blood cells, relative to the red blood cells. Here is a, if you draw blood and you put it in a test tube, the hematocrit is a red blood cell sedimenting down to the bottom. The white blood cells are here in the middle and the plasma up above. So a typical hematocrit is going to be something like about 45 would be a common example of a typical hematocrit. They're often a little bit lower than that. Okay, here's a chart plotting hematocrit uh, versus viscosity. And so the point of this chart is that the higher the hematocrit, the higher the viscosity. That's actually one of the most important variables in how thick the blood is. Viscosity just means how thick the blood is. The reason viscosity is like one of the most important things to know about atherosclerosis, the thicker the blood, the more it clots. The reason people die is because an artery is occluded, it clots off. That's a myocardial infarction in the heart, that's a stroke in the brain. You don't want your arteries clotting off. The key thing about staying healthy and living a long life is all your arteries are open, then all your tissues have good blood flow. So what I'm saying is the higher that hematocrit, the more prone, the more thick the blood, the more prone a person is to clotting. And this is thought to be part of the reason a lot of these bicycle racers, as everybody knows after the Tour de France stuff, the ones that were giving themselves blood transfusions to get up their hematocrits or taking epoetin to increase their hematocrits, it made the blood thicker. And that's thought that that might have been the reason why uh, some of them died of uh, myocardial infarctions, increasing the thickness of the blood. So, you know, it's a very good medicine for people who need it. You know, they've got low hematocrits for other reasons. But if you're an athlete, messing around with that and raising your hematocrit real high for endurance sports, you know, could lead to increased risk of thrombosis potentially. Okay, next thing is um, LDL cholesterol. This is a graph of LDL cholesterol versus viscosity. The higher the LDL cholesterol, the higher the blood viscosity. And that's because LDL sticks red blood cells together. We're going to go over the mechanism of that on the next slide, but that's a key thing to know because people say, oh, cholesterol, what does that have to do with atherosclerosis and blood count? It has a lot. I can also tell you, we'll get into it more in just a bit, but 
atherosclerosis due to cholesterol is just a subset of atherosclerosis. And I'm going to explain why that atherosclerosis really is a blood clot. And you may not have heard that before, but that theory has actually been around since the mid-1800s. And the persons who are really experts in atherosclerosis, um, they'll tell you it's a blood clot. There's some people who see it a little bit differently, and, you know, that's okay, but um, I think they're wrong. Okay, let's now move the slide over a little bit. Okay, the key point on this slide is I, I'm just new to using this um, this program here where I can draw, so I don't, you know, I'm, I don't got it all figured out yet, but I think I, I'm learning from this. Okay, zeta potential means a negative charge on the red blood cells. And I can tell you, I've never in my life met a medical student or, or even a resident who knows what zeta potential is, all right? And this has been well known for a long time because they have to know about it for blood banking to store blood. Each red blood cell has a negative charge on its outer surface and that negative charge is very important because it repels other red blood cells. They're both negatively charged, so it keeps them apart. It's like two batteries that push each other apart. And it's due to what are called sialic acid residues. And in the next slide, I'll show you the chemical structure of a sialic acid residue. But remember that normal red blood cells, both negatively charged, push each other apart, and that is due to zeta potential. Just below it, I've got the word bridge here. There are bridging molecules that stick the red blood cells together. So you can imagine that, let's say this is a bridging molecule. You got one red cell here, here another one, and this blue thing is sticking the red blood cells together. And those are called bridging, bridging molecules. So what are bridging molecules? IgM antibodies, like with an acute infection, can stick the two red blood cells together. LDL cholesterol will stick the two uh, red blood cells together. Fibrinogen from acute stress, for example, will stick the red blood cells together. Elevated uric acid can stick red blood cells together. So I mentioned that because it's like Velcro for RBC, sticking them together, because then you're going to get a rouleau formation, like a stack of coins is the French word. We'll show a picture of that in just a moment. Okay, so that's the key point. RBCs always have a zeta potential. And guess what? The endothelium, the lining cells of an artery also have an endothelium. Okay, and, and by the way, the whole point of this lecture is atherosclerosis is the most common cause of death. Uh, myocardial infarctions are about 26% of deaths. Um, cancer is about 25% of death. And then there's other things where atherosclerosis ends up getting related. Well, atherosclerosis is related to tons of things. People going blind, all the most common causes of uh, blindness uh, in adults over 50 are related to vascular disease one way or another. Okay? Uh, trust me, it's the most important disease. And we're going to get more insight here. We're going to go way beyond the what's your LDL cholesterol level. That's very important, but there's a lot more to it. And when you understand it, you can prevent it more effectively. Okay, this slide here, this picture, is a sialic acid. Sialic acid is very much like glucose with a carboxylic acid on there. There's a little more to it, but that's all you need to know. The baseline ring structure is just like glucose, okay? Now, it's the most common one is called N-acetyl neuraminic acid. You don't need to memorize this, but what you should remember is sialic acids have a negative charge. There's a deprotonated carboxylic acid, therefore there's a negative charge on this oxygen. And the neuraminic acid component is abbreviated NEU, NU, okay? You're going to hear that again. There's a concept of something called xenosialitis due to sialic acids being absorbed from meat products like beef and dairy and pork, for example. The, um, there's a real good video. Um, the guy's name is, I think, Roger Seaholt. His website, his YouTube channel is called uh, MedCram. And he has a very nice lecture on xenosialitis. And that's when a person's absorbing sialic acids across their intestinal membrane of their intestinal tract. And they're, they're getting incorporated because they're so similar. They only differ like by a hydrogen. They're so similar to the sialic acids on our own body that the gut confuses them with our own body sialic acids and sticks them on the glycoproteins on the outer surface of cells. And the outer surface of cells, the glycoproteins, are called the glycocalyx. Uh, but the immune system recognizes them as foreign, so an inflammatory response is mounted to that. And that 
inflammations of called xenoforn sialitis. Itis meaning inflammation. So check out the MedCram video if you're curious about xenosialitis and you're going to keep seeing the word new and that's for the sialic acid, neuraminic acid. All right. Um, but our purpose of seeing it right now is just that there's a negative charge on that and that makes our red blood cells negatively charged. Our endothelium, the lining cells of the arteries, so you know the artery lining cells um, also have a negative charge, a zeta potential, but that's primarily for other reasons, things like their heparin sulfates and whatnot. Okay, so now here we're going to see a rouleau formation. So rouleau is a French word for stack of coins. And what happens is you've got the red blood cell, then you've got the bridging molecule, RBC, bridging molecule, RBC, bridging molecule. And so here are the RBCs getting ready to pass through a capillary. And it's very difficult for them to get through that capillary because there are seven microns in size, a little bigger than the capillary, approximately seven microns. Capillaries, you know, there's variable, but in general, they're about five microns in size. So those red blood cells, they got it. Here's the capillary opening. They got to deform to get in. All right. And it's hard for them to deform when they're stuck to a bunch of other red blood cells. So the blood is thicker. The blood's like a milkshake instead of like water. So the heart has to pump a lot harder. Pressure goes up. And you don't want high blood pressure. It causes all kinds of problems. We're going to talk about that. So that's a key point. Anything that increases blood viscosity will cause increased blood pressure. Anything that increases blood pressure, if it's chronic and prolonged, it will damage arteries. By the way, I'm going to show you the best book ever written on atherosclerosis. It's called Blood Viscosity. Um, the author's name is Gregory Sloop, MD. Um, I read about atherosclerosis all the time. I'm involved in it every day. And I can tell you, this guy's the best researcher in the world currently for atherosclerosis, Gregory Sloop, MD. So if you really want to understand atherosclerosis, I've read tons and tons of stuff about it. This is the best book. And he's a pathologist. And that, there's actually something funny about that. The persons who know the most about atherosclerosis are pathologists. People think, oh, it's going to be a cardiologist or something. No, or a vascular surgeon. No. Vascular surgeons and cardiologists, they do know quite a bit about atherosclerosis, but they tend to think like a plumber. There's a blockage. We need angioplasty, it's stented. We need to bypass it. And yeah, that's great. But it's even better to think like uh, like Esselstyn, for example. Here's probably the best book ever written if you want to reduce your, this is the best book written if you want to reduce your risk of heart disease. It's called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Caldwell Esselstyn. I actually went and trained with him over the clean clinic, Cleveland Clinic. He's a great expert. He's been doing this for many years, since the 1980s. He's got the best results of preventing coronary artery disease of any doctor in the world. Um, his patients, you know, he had they had like 99.4% no recurrent coronary artery or cerebrovascular events. The one patient out of like about 200, 198 patients that had a recurrent event was because they didn't follow the diet. So what I'm trying to say is that's another reason why I think diet is by far the most important thing in coronary artery disease atherosclerosis because if you fix the diet, you can prevent it. If something else was the cause, there's a lot of, there's several other theories of atherosclerosis causation, you would expect the diet would be unable to fix it if that were the case. But diet is able to fix it, okay? So for example, some people talk about the infectious disease bacterial theory of atherosclerosis, which I think is bogus, by the way. Okay, but just so you know about it, yes, they have sometimes found bacteria inside of atherosclerotic plaques, but that's not the causative thing. If it was, then changing your diet probably wouldn't help, but it does. It does help a tremendous amount. We're going to talk about why a little bit later. Um, okay, next thing here is to talk about laminar flow. So look, look at my hand. This, this is kind of the way to get it, okay? The point is, if you look at a hand, that tells you about what laminar flow does. So in the middle here, the red arrows, those are the red blood cells. They're flowing the fastest, like these two fingers. They're flowing the fastest. When you put your hand there, and I, I like to put my other thumb there. So that's where your red blood cells flow, right in the center. Next to them, like this finger, the index finger, the pinky finger, that would be, like these fingers, that would be where the, the white blood cells are flowing, just on the outside of the red blood cells. And then just outside of that, I'm going to put my thumb down here. Is it to be like my two thumbs? That would be like where the plasma is closest to the endothelium, the wall of the artery uh, when they flow. Laminar flow is normal blood flow. So this is normal blood flow, all right? That's what you want. And when blood pressure is normal, you have predominantly laminar flow. Your endothelium, arterial lining cells, are happy with laminar flow. Everything is 
uh, copacetic and perfect um, to their mind when you've got laminar flow. Okay, it's also sometimes called a para parabolic velocity profile of flow. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide. Okay, now here is a um, drawing of the common carotid artery, and then it bifurcates into the external carotid artery that goes up to the face, and the internal carotid artery goes up to the brain. And, and by the way, just so you know, for what it's worth for my background, I did a fellowship in vascular interventional radiology. I did half a fellowship in endovascular interventional radiology, the brain, sometimes called endovascular brain surgery. I did a complete fellowship and am a neuroradiologist. So I look at brains, I look at the carotid artery every day. I've seen many, many, many thousands of these, okay? Um, and I've done, you know, about 400 cerebral arteriograms. So I spent a long time with these blood vessels and I can show you a pattern that'll help you understand how atherosclerosis starts. And it's a similar pattern in the coronary arteries and at other locations. Atherosclerosis typically starts at bifurcations, especially the arteries of the heart, coronary arteries, and of the carotid. Um, see, I got my heart model here. I've got really good coronaries for looking on there. So I was, I was trying to I was looking at my heart model, but it's too small, I think. All right, so anyways, we'll look at the this bifurcation here. The blood comes up the common carotid artery, and then it hits the divider in between the external carotid and the internal carotid. And when it hits the divider, it causes a little bit of chaos in the flow. So it's coming up like a nice laminar flow, all right, like we were talking about. And then it hits the divider, boom, and then it's, it's spread, it starts to go all over the place. So chaotic blood flow is called turbulent blood flow. And then some of the blood flow goes backwards. So I got to get here in the middle here. It goes backwards. And let me see if I can do it this way is better, all right? And that backward flow is called retrograde flow. It's also called eddy currents. There's videos online, like if you watch, I saw this video about a kayak going down a stream and there was like a rock, a big rock in the middle of the stream, and it causes eddy currents. But they're retrograde flow, and the point about them is they're very slow. And you can see these things on ultrasound. If You, you can even look it up. Just put a, an ultrasound on the carotid artery in the neck, and you'll see retrograde flow, backwards flow, um, in the bulb of the carotid. This is called the bulb because it widens a little bit, the origin of the internal carotid artery. And the reason this matters is the endothelial cells, they're kind of spindle-shaped. You're going to see them, too. They're going to be spindle-shaped right next to each other, all right? So I'm trying to expand my field of view. And their spindle shape is aligned along the long axis of normal laminar flow. So when blood flow is chaotic and disturbed, that confuses the endothelial cells. So if there is an excessive amount of turbulent flow, they will be confused by that and sometimes think there's a vascular injury. In addition, blood is... When it's slowed down, it'll sometimes start to clot. Um, if you had two cups, maybe one was one cup of water, one was a cup of blood, they're not the same thing. A cup of water, well, imagine this is a cup. Imagine this is full of water. This is a cup and it's full of water. You could leave it there on a table for an hour and nothing will change. It's a Newtonian fluid. It's the same while it is moving and while it is at rest. But blood is not. Imagine this is a cup full of blood. Okay, this is blood. All right, this is called thixotropic, meaning that it changes during depending on its velocity, all right? So if the blood sits there for a long time, it can start clotting. I actually think that's part of what happens, like if you sit for a long car ride or other type of thing where you're sitting for hours, you get out, you're all stiff, your legs hurt, your feet hurt, and it takes like about 30 seconds before you feel back to normal. And I think it's partly because you're, you're, you're forming little tiny early reversible clots, but also your, your whole vascular system's vasoconstricting. Um, that's part of it. Um, anyways, that's also predisposes people really long traveling. If they just sit in one place, they're in risk for forming clots in other locations like a DVT in a leg. All right, but what's interesting about this? Notice here on this next drawing that the clot forms on the far wall, okay? So there's a couple of really key points here. Number one, atherosclerosis starts at bifurcations. Number two, it starts on the far wall away from the divider. Number three, atherosclerosis begins as a blood clot. And by the way, this is not some type of obscure theory of mine. The best doctors in the world who've really studied atherosclerosis 
know that it is due to atherothrombosis, all right? And it's especially the pathologist. Like I said, the guy who wrote this book, he's a pathologist. The guy who originally came up with the, 30, the theory is a, a pathologist, Rokotansky, back in the 1800s, mid-1800s. Uh, J.B. Duguid, he is a pathologist. And there's another, like the most famous cardiac pathologist in the world is William C. Roberts. And he also agrees with atherothrombosis theory. And the reason I'm smiling, why do I think this is a little funny? Because everybody thinks of vascular surgeons and cardiologists um, and lipidologists as the ones who know a lot about atherosclerosis. But they don't look at it. They just read papers about it, okay? As a radiologist with tons of vascular experience, I look at atherosclerosis. I look at the CT angiograms, the MR angiograms, the catheter angiograms. I've seen tons of them. And the pathologists are the ones who look at it in a microscope. They know the most about what it really looks like under a microscope. And they'll tell you it's due to thrombosis, okay? The ones that have studied it the most, all right? So um, that becomes relevant because to understand atherosclerosis causation and to go beyond just understanding cholesterol, you have to understand that. That's, that's a key point. It begins as a clot on the far wall right here. And then what happens is there are endothelial precursor cells. They're like stem cells for endothelium. And they will cover up this atherosclerotic plaque. And you want to cover it up because you don't want loose clot hanging in the breeze because that could be knocked off by the next high blood pressure pulsation. And little tiny pieces break off and go up to the brain. They'll cause a stroke. If, it's, if this were in the heart, they'd break off distally and potentially block up a vessel. I'm trying to keep in the camera here and block up a vessel and cause myocardial infarction. You know, really small one, you wouldn't notice, but that's an important point. Endothelial stem cells, they're called EPCs, endothelial precursor cells. They cover up the clot and they want to maintain a smooth surface. They really reestablish an intima, that's the uh, inner lining layer of the lumen, to cover up that plaque so there'll be no distal embolization, all right? And then the immune system cells come into the clot and they start reabsorbing it, like the macrophages. They're soaking up the fat. You'll have a, a lipid core. They're soaking up the debris. But an atherosclerotic plaque begins with red blood cells, most commonly, excuse me, stuck to LDL cholesterol. But there's going to be other ways that that can happen as well. There's things that increase the likelihood of having a clot. We talked about anything that increases the thickness of the blood anything that impairs endothelial cell function, like sodium, okay? Excess sodium will inhibit endothelial nitric oxide production, okay? Other reasons, why do I think atherosclerosis is due to blood clot? I've seen thousands of them, the CT angiograms. The density of an atherosclerotic plaque is the same typically as a blood clot, okay? No one can tell it apart from organizing mural thrombus, okay? Eventually, they'll tend to calcify, but guess what? That's the same thing that happens with a hematoma. If you got a hematoma in a muscle, okay? I one time had this patient, he was, you know, getting into a college fraternity and he got his backside paddled, okay? Uh, you know, like the movie Animal House. Thank you, sir, may I have another? And the point is, when the hematoma uh, initially was just blood, it had one appearance, but when it became chronic, it all calcified. That's called myositis ossificans. It's a very characteristic appearance of a hematoma in a skeletal muscle, all right? They calcify. So what I'm saying is that's a very, it's what you would expect to happen if atherosclerosis was a blood clot. And it's exactly what does happen, okay? And it always forms in that far wall location, virtually all, that's the characteristic location of an atherosclerotic plaque. In addition, it is eccentric, meaning that it's only on one side. It forms on the far wall from the bifurcation. And the relevance of that is, if it was an infection or an inflammatory process, as the primary causation, there is some inflammation in the sense that the WBCs have to come in there and reabsorb the clot, reabsorb the miniature hematoma, if you will. If it was primarily infection, if it was primarily inflammation, you would expect it to be circumferential. A vasculitis is typically circumferential, involving the entire circumference of the artery, okay? But it's not. It's eccentric, and it tends to be focal. It eventually gets bigger and bigger, but it tends to start out like that. Okay, now we're going to look at atherosclerotic plaque. And by the way, this information here, this could save your life if you understand it. All right, atherosclerosis is partially reversible. Um, here's an atherosclerotic plaque. We start out by drawing the EPCs, these purple spindle-shaped cells, and they are covering up the blood clot that was formed. And there's always an ongoing uh, steady state of 
platforming and the body removing it, repairing it, and, and covering up with endothelial precursor cells. Okay, so here are the red blood cells, uh, the, red, the red circles, the brown circles are the bridging molecules. The purple spindle shape here are, like I said, the endothelial precursor cells covering up the clot. The yellow material here inside of a white blood cell, these are uh, lipid absorbing cells. So a macrophage full of lipid would be a foam cell, okay? Where there's a whole bunch of them in one area, we'll call that a lipid core, okay? Um, over here, necrotic debris from the red blood cells and the inflama inflammatory process, that's the necrotic core. Necrotic means dead material. All right, and then down here is an F for fibrosis. The orange stuff, orange is a good medical color for calcification, that is calcification. And to some extent, this drawing shows the time course of an atherosclerotic plaque. It starts out just as a pure blood clot, then the immune cells come in like the macrophages, and they start cleaning up and absorbing things. And the reparative process also call, includes the laying down of fibrous tissue. In an actual chronic atherosclerotic plaque, and most of them are chronic, they've been there for years, they're primarily fibrosis, like about 70% fibrosis. And then a variable amount, uh, lipid and necrotic core, maybe about 15%, and then calcification. But the older the plaque is, the more calcified it is. Um, and the relevance is this acute clot material can all be reabsorbed largely. This lipid core can be reabsorbed. Necrotic core can be reabsorbed. So a atherosclerotic plaque can shrink. It's just like, you know, Nathan Pritikin, for example, he had real abnormal EKGs, but then he agreed to be autopsied um, at his death and he had a clean coronary artery. So Nathan Pritikin's a genius. You'll learn a lot from studying him. Um, and he reversed his coronary artery atherosclerosis. Um, Walter Kempner, MD, he also had a whole bunch of EKG reversals with his rice diet workout in North Carolina. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, Dean Ornish did real famous studies where he showed reversal or at least halting of progression of coronary artery disease in many patients who, you know, adapted a plant-based diet. Um, and then Caldwell Esselstyn um, also, you know, had many patients, you know, as, as I was referring to with this book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And Dean Ornish also has good books on um, dietary uh, approach to minimizing atherosclerosis and halting its progression. Okay, so that's an important point. Um, so that's wonderful news. It can be partially reversed. That's good news, okay? Nobody needs to die from coronary artery atherosclerosis. I mean, there's rare, unusual situations with the coronary arteries, but the vast majority of patients is because they eat too much fat, they eat too much salt, too much oils, and all these other things. And the great news is if they change their ways on their bad habits, quit smoking, quit drinking alcohol, they can dramatically improve the blood flow in their arteries. Because not only do you shrink the plaque, also the endothelial cells will start to function better. They'll start to release more nitric oxide. And in so doing, that'll vasodilate the artery. Nitric oxide is the real most important, most powerful vasodilator. There's other ones as well, like prostacyclin, for example. Okay, uh, here this next adjacent drawing is of endothelial cells. And the point was to show how they kind of are a bunch of spindle-shaped cells, and they're aligned in the long axis of flow. And when the flow is laminar, they're happy. They've got little mechanoreceptors that can sense the flow direction. And when, again, it's really, really chaotic and turbulent, that also activates platelets to make the blood more prothrombotic. Plus, and there's when it's very chaotic and there's a significant retrograde component, they'll sense that as injury, and they'll start to shed their glycocalyx, and they'll start to express prothrombotic um, chemicals on their cell surface, and that'll lead to increased risk of thrombus forming on the surface of the uh, endothelial cells. Okay, I'm just getting the slide set up here. All right, so here is a drawing of an endothelial cell, sort of a spindle shape. They produce nitric oxide. That's the most important thing they do. That's the most important thing to know about an endothelial cell. I went, uh, you know, under the training course with Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, and he kept talking about nitric oxide. You know, and I was kind of, I think, the annoying person in the audience. And I'm like, well, why don't you talk about this and this and this part of the mechanism? And he's like, 
we'll get to that. Just, you know, you need to know what you need to do. And so like, who am I to be asking him all these questions? The guy with the best results in the world. But it was kind of funny. What he told me later on, I had a conversation with him one-on-one and he said, I just want to make it clear to the, to the audience, you know, the patients that nitric oxide, if you're aware of that, everything will be good with your endothelial cells. If you optimize the way you eat and live for your nitric oxide production and all the other stuff is secondary. And I think he's absolutely 100% right. Um, but there is a lot of other interesting things happening with an endothelial cell. So the nitric oxide is like a gas that goes out into the blood and helps inhibit platelet aggregation. So it prevents platelets from clotting. Um, it also then goes posterior to the, scale, to the smooth muscle cells in the wall of the artery, causes them to vasodilate under healthy conditions. Um, prostacyclin does basically about the same thing. Vasodilator prevents platelets from aggregating or clotting. And it's a bit, and you know, like I said, the muscles, it helps over there as well to get them to relax. Okay. Um, the endothelial cells have a negative charge along them, like with the heparin sulfates, negative charges on the sulfates and antithrombin three binds to the heparin sulfates. And that also helps prevent clotting on their, on the surface of the endothelium of the arteries. And there's other things. There's thrombomodulin, there's tissue factor pathway inhibitor, there's TPA production. But the big thing to know about is healthy nitric oxide production. Excessive dietary sodium can inhibit nitric oxide production, uh, which is real common with processed food, too much sodium. Whereas, you know, a lack of eating plants, plants provide potassium and magnesium, which are vasodilators to keep these arteries open. Okay, so this is just atherosclerosis part one. There's a whole bunch of details and controversy in atherosclerosis. We'll talk about that in a future lecture. But I uh, just want to hit on a couple high points and give an overview introductory with this atherosclerosis part one lecture. What makes blood hypercoagulable? So here's the first list of things sickle cell does. So sickle cell is hemoglobin SS. So when you get both of the genes for sickle cell, that's sickle cell anemia. If you only get one gene for sickle cell, that would be sickle cell trait. And why does it even exist? Because it is protective against malaria. So somebody who has sickle cell trait, it would just be hemoglobin S, and all it is is one uh, base pair shifted in the DNA. That has a protective effect and reduces the risk of death from uh, malaria uh, versus having both makes the blood, uh, the red blood cells sickle shaped and is very prothrombotic. And why am I mentioning it? Because all it takes is sickled RBCs to thrombose an artery and have a myocardial infarction or a stroke. And this can happen at a very young age. And, and, and the reason that matters is myocardial infarction, atherosclerosis, due to a clot. Okay, they have no other risk factors. They don't have high cholesterol, lots of these patients, okay? We talk about LDL cholesterol being the major risk factor, the most important, the most common risk factor. There's even um, atherosclerosis experts, and these are some of the most famous experts in the entire world who will tell you that you need to have elevated LDL cholesterol uh, to have a myocardial infarction, but that's actually not true. When it's been looked at more closely, there's a, you can have a myocardial infarction without having a high LDL cholesterol, and that's actually well known now, but I'm, I'm just telling you, LDL is so important. It's like the most important common variable for having a myocardial infarction, all right? And it's because it's a bridging molecule. It sticks the red blood cells together, and you'll get that elevated from eating meat, from oils, high fructose corn syrup. A lot of that gets converted in the liver into fat, and it'll lead to elevated LDL cholesterol. Same thing with drinking a lot of alcohol, the two carbon units of ETOH, ethyl alcohol, also get converted into acetyl coase and saturated fats, palmitic acid, and uh, increase LDL cholesterol. Um, one thing that's real interesting, animal protein actually increases your, your blood cholesterol. I learned that from T. Colin Campbell with his China study and additional books. Um, and I think what happens is sort of large amounts of dietary animal protein, they ramp up the body into this pro-synthetic mode and it starts driving up things like uh, cholesterol and all as well as hormones that encourage cell replication uh, like leucine goes up activates mTOR but that's a different subject okay high fibrinogen high fibrinogen occurs due to stress and stress equivalents like a lack of sleep dietary caffeine um, inflammation um, a high hematocrit is caused by tobacco uh, smoking because of the hypoxia to compensate the hematocrit goes up the more red blood cells are produced to carry oxygen taking medications that cause increased red blood cells there's a disease called polycythemia varia uh, where they just have high hematocrit makes the blood real thick pressure has to go up and then you get that whole cascade of high blood pressure causing endothelial injury at the bifurcations of 
the arteries to the brain, the carotid, the arteries to the heart, the coronaries. Um, turbulent flow, as we spoke of with any cause of high blood pressure, like excess dietary sodium, other things that make the blood thick, splenectomy, diabetes. With diabetes, you got all kinds of problems with your blood. You got hyperglycemia, more molecules in the blood. You got hyperlipidemia, more molecules in the blood. And there's additional problems with it. It causes a microvasculopathy, induces endothelial dysfunction. Activated platelets, that happens with stress. Okay, uh, let me just slide this thing over a little bit more. Okay, just a few other things. Infection, infection, uh, especially a severe acute infection, um, can cause a lot of patients will die with a severe acute infection, not because of the infection itself, but because they have a myocardial infarction or a stroke. If they've got these other baseline risk factors and you superimpose on top of it, IgM antibodies sticking all their red blood cells together, that can lead them to thrombosing some of their major arteries. Um, things that stiffen the red blood cells excessive saturated fat and trans fat that will lead to their incorporation into the plasma cell membranes of the red blood cells and predispose them to being stiffer, less deformable, therefore increased blood viscosity, pressure goes up and you get all this sequence of events. By the way, I think hypertension is the most important disease because hypertension is the gateway to all this other stuff. And so that's why I'm a big believer, a person, if they have hypertension, they should really try to optimize all their health habits to get it under control. Because if they get it down pretty well, um, they'll probably be fine, but they gotta be careful not to overtreat it either, because if they drop their pressure too low, they could have a stroke. So the best thing to do is, if you can, prevent it with good dietary habits, low sodium and low fat diet and avoiding all these other risk factors. Being cold makes the blood thicker. I think that's part of why old people tend to like to retire um, to the south, where it's warmer. Um, TMAO is produced by, you know, we need a meat diet, the meat-related gut bacteria will make the TMA, it goes through the portal vein to the liver, makes TMAO, and that increases atherosclerosis risk factors. Okay, and so that's all the drawings I had. Um, gosh, I can't even see the amount of time we've gone so far. I have a couple slides. I'll just see if the slides, if it works for this video and if you like them. Let's see if I can switch into looking at slides here. Hey, I got it. Got to accept it. Okay, I'm just going to show a couple slides here. Kind of a long talk, but it's a good introduction, I think, to give you the overview of atherosclerosis. So in the future one, we'll talk about a lot of the controversies and some of the cool, interesting stuff. But the bottom line, like, what could you get out of this, this lecture? Pay attention to Caldwell Esselstyn. He knows what he's talking about. I, I've, been studying I've been studying atherosclerosis 25 years. I did, like I said, a fellowship in vascular disease. And Esselstyn's right. And I trained with him. He's right, okay? And he's, it's, it's like a miracle. I mean, there's a way to escape from this, what otherwise previously seemed inevitable. I, the work of Esselstein, Ornish, and others, and Kempner. And it's great that it exists. Have an attitude of gratitude and prevent this stuff. Because um, it doesn't just plug up the arteries of the heart. It plugs up the arteries of the Johnson, to the brain, to the ears, to the eyes, to the spine, everywhere. I mean, these old people, they got total body ischemia. Ischemia is lack of blood supply to tissues, and it's making them real sick, and it makes them miserable. There's nothing good about it. Um, trashes the kidneys as well. Okay, um, let's see now if I can move these along. Uh, oh, I gotta move them through the um, other program here. Okay, hopefully you can see these. Um, endothelium, we talked about it having nitric oxide as the vasodilator. Um, let me see if I push the other button if it works here. Yeah, it's working now. Okay, now I think this is what I want. Um, we talked about nitric oxide. That's the most important thing to know about. If you only know one thing about the endothelium, know that it makes nitric oxide to dilate the artery, to prevent clotting. Um, that's the key thing. Prostacyclin does the same thing, but nitric oxide is more important. Antithrombin also prevents clotting. Oh, but in order to run this, I got to keep on going back to the other thing. That's kind of a pain. So, and I got too many slides. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just make the rest of the slides uh, part of uh, atherosclerosis part two. So this will be atherosclerosis part one. I hope that was helpful. And again, the key point is the diet works. Uh, the Esselstyn diet, he has the best results. There's no diet even close. The Lyon study was not even close. He had 30 times uh, fewer patients uh, with you got a 30 times better chance of not having a recurrent cerebrovascular event, cardiovascular cerebral event with Esselstyn's diet. So it's a wonderful thing. I do follow it too. Low sodium, low salt, 100% plant-based, whole foods, 100% organic. Um, so 
Uh, that really works. I, I, I hope this was interesting to you. And you want to avoid anything that makes your blood thick or predisposes to clotting. I mean, there's a lot of little things that come out of this. For example, I always want to be warm. And sometimes that gets me into a disagreement with my family. They want the thermostat lower. I like to be warm. And then I just have to wear, you know, jackets and stuff inside the house. Um, a whole bunch of little other things come up to help thin the blood in a positive way. Uh, so anyways, I hope that's helpful.